And today we still ha uh, now, now, of course, by, by uh, automating the paperwork, we uh, can make, s and making it better, we, we can make a more efficient use of the physical work that does go on. So we don't do things redundantly, and, and we don't, uh, uh, and, and we, we just streamline the process. Uh, but but doing, doing, doing simple things like, like cleaning and, and, uh, and bringing things from place to place and, and maybe uh, re small repairs, uh, you know, it seems so easy. It, it's something that, that we don't pay people very much to do. Uh, and there has been much interest in building machines to do it. And it's eluded us. It's eluded us in the, in the 20s uh, when, when, uh, when there were electronic robots built, but, but they simply were not smart enough to, to do almost anything. In, by, by the 60s, uh, there were some machines that used um, rather simple control strategies. Uh, well, I actually, I don't want to give too many slides because that slows it way down. Uh, so, so by the 60s, we had machines follow, uh, that could transport things from place to place in, uh, in factories, for instance, uh, following bar signals from buried wires. The, the, the circuitry in these was very simple, just, just a couple of tubes uh, basically running a, a little servo loop. And by the 80s, when microprocessors became available to put into robots, before that computers were much too expensive to, to consider in, in an actual practical application that substituted basically for one person. Uh, so somewhat fancier methods were, were developed that, uh, that used navigational markers uh, mounted on the walls, but they, or, or, or special programming for specific routes, but they required a specialist to install these robots. And in fact, the market has been extremely anemic for, the, for those kinds of machines. At the same time, there was research going on some of it at a, at a little agricultural college uh, on the West Coast. Uh, uh, this, this, this was a research institute uh, related to it called, called SRI. Uh, and and uh, at, 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 uh, at the Stanford Junior University itself, <laughs> uh, there was this thing called a Stanford cart. This, was, this building was, used to be up on Arrastradero Road. It's, it's a horse farm now. Um, and the, uh, the Stanford cart uh, was able to, uh, in 1979, uh, cross a, a cluttered room, m mapping about 30, 30 things and uh, taking about five hours to cross 30 meters. <laughs> and that was the state of the art. Um, now we have a thousand MIPS. And and uh, it's becoming possible to build dense three-dimensional maps of the, sur of the surroundings you, with containing basically millions of points, at least hundreds of thousands. Uh, an intermediate step, which I won't show you, uh, that, that builds two-dimensional maps has al is already controlling a lot of research robots that are running down hallways with a mean time between failure uh, that is getting lost or, or uh, stuck. Uh, of about a day, which is not good enough for for for, uh, for, for practical use, but but uh, is on the way. Uh, with uh, with three-dimensional maps, uh, the estimate is that the mean time between failure is, is in the months, and and that that's probably good enough for a first range of products. So so the the uh, the expectation is that within the next five years. Uh, Three-dimensional mapping will show up on industrial vehicles, uh, uh, guided vehicles that, that uh, can go from place to place and can make those vehicles smart enough that new routes can be given to them by ordinary factory workers, which means that, that there should be a lot more of these in use uh, in, in hundreds of thousands is, is the estimate. Um, okay, Cleaning machines. There, there was an attempt to, to do these in the 80s, but uh, automate these, uh, make them robotic, but it simply doesn't pay with a cleaning machine, as it was discovered, to pay a specialist to map each and every room the machine has to do. 
and whenever a, a new area has, has to be cleaned, you have to call in the specialist again. Much, much more uh, economical to pay minimum wage to somebody to push it through those areas. <laughs> Another factory vehicle. Uh, this will create a security robot. Uh, that, that patrols warehouses. There's a couple of hundred of these in use. Again, extremely anemic market at the moment. Uh, and, and the problem is that, that, these, that the 80, these earlier generation machines take a specialist to install and can be used only in very limited places where, where things uh, uh, don't change much. By, by making them smart, uh, they can go uh, anywhere uh, you lead them through through, uh, through through the route that they're supposed to do. They memorize the, the three-dimensional uh, surroundings and then locate themselves relative to it. So, anyway, the plan continues. Uh, the, the the industrial market grows modestly, uh, up to hundreds of thousands, maybe a few millions, and leads ultimately to enough credibility for the technology before 2010. Uh, I, I I'm planning this kind of thing, which is a robot vacuum cleaner that's smart enough to uh, basically be brought home, taken out of its box, turned on, and its, its first instinct will be to explore your house <laughs> and, and, build, and build a map. And after that, it, it 99% uh, of the time can simply be left alone and it will figure out you know, when, when are the appropriate times to run when, when there's, when there's no, nobody home. And, uh, and of course, as it runs, it, it fills up with dust. Uh, it, it, it doesn't move furniture, but it's low enough to get under it. Uh, it fills up with dust and its batteries run down. So it, most of the time, we'll, we'll fix that at a docking station where, where it both recharges and regurgitates. <laughs> Uh, and this is the, uh, the dust bin that, that gets cleaned about once a month, say, by a human at, at this stage. Uh, no, not this one, but the later ones. I'll, I'll, I'll get to those just before I finish here. Uh, here, here it is. Uh, it, I'm sorry, these are so dark. Here it is edging. The, 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 the wheels are individually steerable. This is just a fantasy design, but, but uh, it, it sort of uses the, the best ideas we had at the time. Uh, it, by the way, there these little buttons that you uh, see uh, are are actually cameras. It, it uses stereoscopic vision to build its three-dimensional maps. That, those are the techniques that we've been using now, and and with a thousand MIPS of computing, that can be done about once a second. And so so that's the bare minimum. It's a thousand MIPS that has that has made these things possible now. Thousand MIPS and and uh, probably a couple of hundred megabytes. Uh, which is an amount of computation that simply was out of reach in, in all of the uh, 80s and, in fact, most of the 90s. Is there a an yes, yes. Uh, in fact, I, have, I, I, I worked hard to, to try to find an animal that was just the right size based on this comparison between nervous systems and, and brains, but it, which depends on the level of emulation. Uh, if if uh, Ray wants to do it at the level of neurons, you get you get a larger number. I like to do it because because that's why we've done it at the level of of uh, things like edge operations, uh, where where you have a, a, f a few hundred neurons being replaced by the most efficient code that can do that job. And at that level, uh, a thousand nips is about equivalent to a guppy, <laughs> a, sm a small fish. <laughs> Uh, and, and sometimes it's out in the field and, and it's kind of far to go back to its, uh, to its docking station. So, so there's no reason why it shouldn't, shouldn't uh, re recharge you know, if, it, if it's not yet full. So this leads uh, in, in, the, in, this, in this scenario to, to uh, of course, a large mass market for, for things like this, these little, little gadgets. Um, but also the, the perception that more is possible so we've, these, these are, the uh, vacuum cleaners are